All right, everyone, we are back. And so now we are going to get into our atomic structure and bonding discussion, and specifically um, the finding of Bragg. So hopefully we remember from uh, kind of chemistry courses um, mm -hmm. that we have a nucleus, which is composed of protons and neutrons. And most importantly for us, a lot of material behavior is determined by electrons. And specifically, um, the outermost shell of electrons are valence electrons. Now, um, this is where we have to kind of take a quick depart, or not a quick departure, a, a significant departure, but an important departure nonetheless. Um, electrons possess a very, very unique quality in that they have particle wave duality. Um, so electrons are neither particles or, and they are neither waves. They exhibit both of those properties simultaneously. And this is actually demonstrated by a famous experiment, the double slit experiment, um, conducted by Thomas Young in 1801. Um, he showed this in light. Later, Davison and Germer, uh, they did this uh, with electrons with the double split. But the the concept is this. If I were to shoot, if I had a double slit, and if I were to shoot paintballs through that, pure particles, obviously, I would see a pattern on the other side of that slit where obviously two bands of paintballs go across. <coughs> Excuse me. If I shoot a ray of electrons, um, uh, or light, as Thomas uh, Young did, through these double slits. On the outer side, you'll observe this pattern, which is called a diffraction pattern or an interference pattern. This illustrates that these electrons are not behaving as particles in this instance per se, but as actually waves. And this interference pattern is fr uh, from uh, when the wave passes through this double slit, there will be simultaneously constructive and destructive interference um, that leads to this type of pattern. Um, so constructive and destructive interference, and you can kind of see this um, schematically shown here, that same experiment. If we see these uh, essentially waves propagating and hitting these double slits, and then you see kind of this combination of either they constructively interfere, which means that they amplify, or destructively interfere. So you can kind of see this, if I have an incoming wave and a scattering wave of the same amplitude and of the same wavelength in phase, meaning that, again, you see that when we're low here, we're low here, when we're high here, we're high here. If they are perfectly in phase, we have perfect constructive interference. And we would expect that this to be double the amplitude. If these waves are phase shifted by 90 degrees here and here, when I add them, I'm high here and I'm low here, the result will be zero. So this is perfect destructive interference. So you can kind of see here in the bands, these are constructive interference. When there's nothing here, these gaps, that's destructive interference, kind of like ripples in a water in, a, in an array. This is an extremely important, um, this is a very, very, very important um, uh, phenomenon that we can observe here. Uh, and this is going to allow us and actually allowed for one of the most important material finding um, that we're going to kind of talk about in this course. Um, and this phenomenon of constructive and destructive interference is particularly relevant for x-ray diffraction. So when will we have diffraction? And x-ray diffraction will allow us to look at atomic structure of materials. Diffraction is going to occur when we have very specific set of conditions. So I need a series of regularly spaced obstacles or slits that are capable of scattering essentially an incident wave. And they have to have spacings that are comparable to the magnitude of the wavelength and the incident wave. Uh, and to observe diffraction, we need to have constructive interference and specifically, most ideally, perfect constructive interference. Um, so we need to have those conditions in order to see or observe essentially diffraction. Uh, so how is this relevant? Well, um, it's very relevant in terms of Bragg diffraction. So this is a record that will never be broken. So Sir, Warren, Sir William Lawrence Bragg, who was, I had a fantastic professor when I was um, uh, a material science student, um, Professor Lynn Hobbs. And Lynn Hobbs was a graduate student of Bragg. Um, <laughs> So very, very brilliant man. Um, uh, was very influential. I have lots of stories about Professor Hobbes, um, uh, amazing person. But anyways, um, William Bragg 
won the Nobel Prize when he was 25 and won it with his father. That's never going to be repeated. But, the, but Bragg understood this concept of diffraction and specifically constructive and destructive interference and understood that, well, I need to explore structures with regular spacings and the wavelength that I use has to be commensurate with the size and the, and the, the, the size of these spacings. So if I want to investigate materials and bonding, and just like we talked about at the beginning of this class, we know that if I want to look at atomic structures that are about angstrom distances apart, so for example, a carbon-carbon bond um, is fully saturated is about 1.54 angstroms, which is similar to copper alpha radiation. Um, so if I investigate structures with this type of wavelength, I can look at atomic structures, x-rays. Um, why can't I do this with light? Well, if I look at light or like a laser, you're looking at things, what is it, like 200 to 800 nanometers, excuse me if, I, if that's wrong, but visible light is, again, that's a, th you know, thousand times larger, you know, thousands of times larger than this distance. So I can't look, use a laser to investigate atomic structures. I need an x-ray. Copper alpha radiation is the one of the most commonly used. So Bragg thought, okay, well, we could use this to investigate material structure and devised a brilliant derivation that is ex basically just using very fundamental geometry to actually calculate distances between planes. So Bragg's schematic was this one. So if I have an instant ray, a, di a beam, um, an X-ray, for example, with some wavelength uh, lambda, and if I shoot this X-ray and it hits, again, I have my regular series of obstacles with uh, basically spacing on the order of angstroms uh, for the most part. If I have, and I shoot this beam, and it's going to hit and diffract off of here, and I have a detector over here, that looks and actually, you know, basically detect, detects that wavelength. If I have, if there's another beam that's going here and hitting the next row of atoms here and bouncing off, if I need to have diffraction, it has to bounce off, and I need this, this, uh, this wavelength here and this wavelength here to constructively interfere, meaning I need this wavelength and this wavelength to be in phase. So how can I develop some mathematical expression to achieve perfect constructive interference? Well, if I look at this wavelength here and this here, there's an extra distance that this travels, AB and BC. Other than that, those are exactly the same. So what Bragg said was, I need this extra distance AB and BC to be in phase, meaning I need it to be some multiple of the wavelength. Because if it's 0.5, then I basically just shifted the wavelength, you know, <laughs> I've shifted by 90 degrees and I'm gonna get hor I'm gonna get destructive interference. So I needed to be some integer multiple of that wavelength. And if I know that in between these arrays of the these arrays or these planes of atoms, if I assign it some arbitrary, you know, some distance, DHKL. I can now write an expression here. So I know that I can use opposite over adjacent. So this AB is going to be equal to DH times sine theta and the same thing for BC. Uh, and again, I'm shooting it and I control, I control this incident wavelength and then it bounces off at this two theta at this detector angle. But that's for another story for another day. Um, so I can derive and just add these up and I could achieve and see Bragg's law. Very frustrating. Nobel Prize just because of geometry. <laughs> but uh, again, it took that. This is ingenious when you're, again, this is all conceptual um, the buildup and actually the derivation of this until this is verified with experimentation. That amazing, fantastic. Um, and you could also find relationships for cubic materials, not it, cubic. Um, you can look at relationships between uh, lattice parameters and HKL, which are. Um, basically, these are Miller indices, and we'll talk about those in just a bit. Um, but uh, these are all things that we can derive from Bragg, and we're going to do a fun um, kind of a mystery, a murder mystery, not really murder, it's just materials, but uh, a mystery material identification um, lab. So, uh, excellent. So that is Bragg's Law. So next time, we are going to get into different types of bonding. 
uh, and specifically investigating these valence electron materials, or valence electrons and how they influence bonding and electronegativity as well, and potentials. So many things to do. All right. All right thank you, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.